Hello, everyone. I am hoping that all of you are well, that you took yesterday's wellness day to mean something important to you, um, to figure out what it means for you to celebrate and um, yourself and honor yourself by treating yourself well. Um, and so I was thinking about all of you yesterday and really hoping that that it was a good good day for you. Uh, welcome to Wednesday of week four. Um, we are diving in further and further to this, uh, to the material of this class and I just get more excited as we go. So you might want to write down this quote um, as an important point um, as you're considering your question for um, for pack back this week as you're writing your own question. You may also want to consider it um, when you're thinking about resolving that nature mystery. So here, I'll give you a moment, write it down. Um, so resolving a nature mystery, I mentioned this also on Monday. It's listed there um, in Canvas with the week four reflection action assignment. This is essentially what it is. Take a photo or make a sketch of something that attracts your attention and leads you to ask a question. That's pretty broad. It can be just about anything. Research until you find the answer to your question. That might be Google. That might be asking people. It might be living your way into the answer and asking follow-up questions. And then the, attach that photo or sketch along with the explanation of your discovery as an extra credit point. And that's due anytime between now and April 23rd. So that's an option for you. Another extra credit opportunity that we have um, is the blog. And that's going to be, um, that is available and up. And to access the blog, you will, um, you will go to Canvas and then pages. I'll send you a message about this too. Canvas, pages, and then find the blog listed there, the link to the blog. If you find that you have not been added to the blog, um, then you will contact Valerie and she's listed there. Um, for you to reach out to. So those are options um, for you. On Monday, you heard from Tiffany and Lily and Grace all about the concepts of home um, and thinking about the, the idea that all of those concepts that they talked about are wrapped into the one that I wrapped up at, with at the end of class. The idea that um, that earth supports our view of home, no matter what it is. Earth is home. We are not apart from earth, we are part of earth. Not apart from, a part of. So take a moment to bring your focus to yourself and breathe. being as attentive as you can to the inner workings of your body. Some of those we can attend to more than others. We're going to continue this theme, not just today, but throughout the semester, but more today, the idea of seeing with new eyes, that quote that I just had you write down. In the last two classes, we talked all about our connection with Earth, the beginnings of Earth, as well as the concept of Earth as home, being a part of Earth. One of you um, in one of the groups suggested this. If Earth is home, then it is um, it, my responsibility to clean it and that every other human being are my roommates. And so not only is it my responsibility to make sure my roommates are accountable to keep home clean, but it's also my responsibility to be nice to all of my roommates, which means all human beings. 
it's a way of connecting. Um, so becoming aware, paying attention, asking questions and being curious is all part of it. It can all lead to that shift of perspective. If you remember when we did the, the spiraling clockwise finger that all of a sudden becomes counterclockwise. It's a shift of perspective. And so right there at the top of this slide, not apart from earth, apart of earth. Those little words matter. So take a moment now and in your notes, or if you want to type into your Zoom chat, that's fine too. Um, in fact, that'd be great if you do that. Um, jot down five ways that you participate in Earth's cycles. How is it that you are a part, a part of Earth? Five ways you're a part of Earth. And as you re read the responses from your classmates, you may have an aha moment, ways that you're connected in, in uh, somehow that you didn't expect or that you never thought about. So you can make notes to each other about that too. It's fun to share our discoveries, just, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. That's so cool. Or, oh no, really? I didn't know that. That's a perfect thing to say. I don't know. That's amazing. So ways that they're connected. We're gonna go through some of these ways um, that I'm sure that some of you have listed in your groups. Just a few of them we'll cover today, I expect. So this one, breathing in, I receive my breath from plants. And breathing out, I give my breath to plants. So each day at the beginning of this class, we start with our breathing. But had you thought about the fact that what you're exhaling is what plants around you need? It's the air cycle. We talked about the fact that we are actually living in earth. Um, the fact that that atmosphere is holding us together um, or holding us here. And then that's what we're taking into our bodies is atmosphere. We're taking it in and letting it out. It's It was those supernovas, think back to the universe class that the most energetic explosions that occur in the universe, the supernovas, that's what produce the oxygen that our bodies need. We must inhale oxygen and plants must inhale carbon dioxide. It's a pretty perfect system of sharing those things that we need back and forth, producing the things that other things need. It's a cycle. So how much oxygen now is cycled through each tree? Um, it's generally accepted that one mature tree can provide enough oxygen for two people. Quite a lot, it's pretty significant. So I think about even these plants that are hanging behind me and what are they doing? How, are, how, are, how am I affecting them and how are they affecting me? with the cycling of the nutrients of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So the air cycle. Some of you probably mentioned the water cycle and how we are a direct um, part of the water cycle. So remember again, back to the universe class, we are about 70% water. Um, there, 
an interesting fact is that there is no more water on earth, no more or no less water on earth than when earth was formed. It's all still here. It's just wrapped up in different parts, parts of the cycle, right? So there's some that's caught water that's caught in trees or water that's caught in groundwater, water that's caught in clouds, but they aren't caught there forever and ever. Um, and it's not getting lost. It's just being held until it's released to the next part of the cycle. So even thinking about, you know, un, in that groundwater, that's going to be cycled back through um, as, as water keeps on moving. The water in glaciers ha, may, may have been stuck there for a long time, but it's not permanently there. We drink the same water that the dinosaurs drank, that our great great grandparents drank. It's also another way to think about that is that we could be 70% dinosaur pee, not just 70% water. It's been all kinds of places in all kinds of times. There might be water in my body that was part of glaciers, or it could have been hanging in a cloud over the Arctic somewhere. It's pretty cool to think about the way that, that those molecules move from place to place. What's the history of water in your water bottle? How many cycles has it been through? Where have those molecules been? And where will they go next? Well, if they're in your water bottle, it's very likely that they're going to con be cycled through you in some way. They're going to be eventually moved through your body and eventually moved back out as your pee, right? <laughs> it's all part of the natural cycle. Is this gross? Not really. Not really, it's just natural. It's part of the cycle. It's interesting that an exhaustive description of the composition of human urine was prepared for NASA in 1971. As they were thinking about more and more missions to space, what is, what is urine? What is pee anyway? What's it made up of? And what else could we do with it? How could we use it? Or where should we put it? You know, we're in a space shuttle. It's not like we can just flush it and have it be gone. So urine is an aqueous solution of greater than 95% water. The remaining constituents, the remaining parts of P are urea, chloride, sodium, potassium, creatinine, and other dissolved ions, inorganic and organic compounds. So it's over 95% water. Um, but that water is clearing out all kinds of, of that other stuff that our body doesn't need. So that's really important to acknowledge. Um, so that other stuff that I just read off, minerals, hormones, enzymes, natural antibodies are in that pee. You or your doctor can tell some things about your, your whole, how your body is working by looking at your pee. For instance, the other day I noticed that um, my pee was, was really clear, um, which in some ways is really good because that shows that I'm drinking enough water. But I also know that if I'm getting enough vitamin B in my diet, then my, my pee is gonna be somewhat yellow. Um, but this was like few days where it was just really clear. And so I know that my body is on a vitamin B shortage. Um, so looking at my pee helped me to realize something, oh, that could be why I feel a little low on energy. It's because my body's not getting enough vitamin B. Um, so you can tell stuff like that by looking at your pee. Um, 
But if you do a doctor can do a urinalysis and it can tell a lot more. Um, it can tell some very complex sorts of, it can help to diagnose diabetes or vasculitis, as well as some things like, just like dehydration. Um, so all of that can be told from your pee. There are some people in the world that believe that the immune defense agents in urine might help cure a number of diseases and afflictions. This has not been scientifically proven that I can find, but people do practice around the world. There are people that practice urine therapy. And so they are, um, they are drinking, say, a tablespoon of their pee mixed into their orange juice every day. And that could be something that's good for health. So this is not something that I practice, but it is something that others do um, and believe that it has health benefits. And so this is an interesting way of, for me to admit ignorance and open to discovery um, just by what? Oh, that's so interesting that people choose to do that. So what, at this point is coming up for you about being parts of these cycles, part of the air cycle, part of the water cycle. We're gonna continue a little more of the water cycle after this, but I wanna give you a chance, you know, just in your chat, what's coming up for you right now? How many of you pay attention to your pee? How many of you even thought about it or not, or do it daily? So take just a couple of minutes, just two minutes and check in, see what's coming up for you. And then we'll continue. All right, so continuing on through how these waters, if we're 70% water, um, we must be cycling more water than just through our pee. Um, so there's another, another thing here, sweat. Um, so think about your association with sweat. I kind of, Sometimes people say, oh, it's, it's embarrassing. Like, I hate it when I get that little circle under it. Like, ew, it's gross. Um, but actually, our sweat is really vital to what we do. We, I think that we all know this. The evaporation of sweat from our skin surface has a cooling effect due to ev evaporative cooling. So as it evaporates off our skin, it helps cool our bodies. Um, and so in hot weather or in um, when our muscles heat up due to exertion, 
more sweat is produced. And then those fluids are produced by our sweat glands that are in the skin of all mammals. For instance, birds don't sweat. They can't get their feathers wet because then they wouldn't be able to fly. So animals that don't sweat, even dogs who do have some of these glands don't have as many as we do. And so they have to pant. So birds and dogs and lots of other animals pant to cool off their bodies. Um, I'm, what would it be like if we had to pant to cool off? It's kind of an interesting reflection. Um, but instead we sweat and sometimes sweat a lot depending on how much exertion or depends on what's happening in our bodies. It could be because of the heat um, of the air around us. And so we lose a lot to, of our water through sweat, but we also are being detoxified. So sometimes we can clear as much as our 30% of our bodily waste through sweat. Um, and so that's another reason that some people think that it's dirty. Um, it, it does, some sweat glands are different than others and are producing more or they're in areas that don't get as much fresh air. And so that's why sweat stinks. It's not actually the sweat that stinks, it's the bacteria that stinks. So, um, so sweat is a really important water process that our body um, that our body is, is using all the time. I want to share this one comment that came in through the chat. Um, someone says, I realize how much of an impact I can have on the envir environment while still being impacted by the environment. It is a give and take relationship. Um, it's all connected all the time, all the time. And one more water that I'd like to address, um, our spit. So here, I'm gonna, gonna get some. Okay, so some of my spit here in the syringe. What is the difference between spit and saliva? What is the difference between spit and saliva? Well, saliva is essential for digestion, okay? It's the digestive process actually starts in our mouths when we chew. The salivary glands make this, make this saliva. It's a digestive juice, which helps to moisten our food and make it more easily, to, easily swallowed um, moving down through your esophagus and into your stomach. Saliva also has enzyme in it that start to break down starches in your food. So when I first connected with Valerie, I was eating pretzels and that has a starch. They are made of mostly starch. And so my saliva was starting to break that, those starches down before I even swallowed. There are also enzymes in this saliva that help keep our oral bacteria at a healthy level. Saliva is also made of mostly water. In fact, 98% water with electrolytes and antibacterial compounds and enzymes, and also mucus as the lubrication that helps for swallowing. And some animals that you've heard that dogs licking wounds can be, can actually help clean the wound. Well. It's probably true. There's nerve growth factor that helps um, in animals, some animal saliva that can help to heal wounds quickly. And so this is pretty important stuff, I suppose, that I should keep it. I'll keep it with me. So these cycles continue. And now this cycle, the water cycle, for us that I just talked about how our saliva helps us to digest directly connects to the nutrient cycle. So we receive from earth and we give back to earth. We eat, we poop, everyone poops. 
This is the way that those soil nutrients move through the Earth's system. So it's starting in the food production. And when I mean food production, I mean, I think about even out here in my backyard where I grow my basil to make my pesto and grow my blueberries to put on my cereal, that those are sucking up, those plants, those basil plants and those blueberry plants are sucking up the nutrition out of the dirt, taking those into their bodies and then producing what I want to eat. So it's the nutrient cycle that's going directly from the soil in my backyard into the food that I'm eating right now, the blueberries that are in the freezer and the pesto that I made from the basil. It's something that I eat pretty regularly. And so those, that nutrients, um, those nutrients came directly from my yard. It's this important element of carbon as well as nitrogen and phosphorus that are going into the plants that we eat and then being used by our bodies. And in our bodies, so we talked about it starts in our mouths with the saliva is breaking down starches and then into the stomach where the stomach acid and enzymes continue to break down the food and the muscles of the stomach mix the food with those digestive juices. And then your pancreas plays a role that the enzymes break down the carbohydrates and fats um, and proteins as well. That starts happening in the pancreas. And then it delivers this digestive slurry to the small intestines. And then that's where, oh, I forgot, your liver um, helps to digest the fats and some of the vitamins are pulled out and stored in the liver, um, or they might move on to the small intestine where they can get absorbed by, into your body um, for use. And so that's really the small intestine is where all the, mo a lot of the action happens, the complete breakdown of proteins and carbohydrates and fats. Um, and so that's where um, the, the small intestine and moves water from your bloodstream to help break down food and your small intestine absorbs water with those nutrients. Um, it, then they go to storage or they go directly to use depending on what our bodies need. Um, special cells help absorb nutrients to cross the intestinal lining into the bloodstream. And we're gonna come back to that point in just a, a moment. The large intestine and then sucks more water um, it, back into your bloodstream out of the food that you've been eating because it's now preparing what's left over. All of the not usable stuff is then being processed so that you can poop it out, okay? There's, a, just like by observing your pee, there's a lot that could be observed by your poop. How much water is in it? How tightly packed are you? Is it, um, yeah, or maybe are you? And so it just is a lot about how effectively or efficiently our bodies are functioning. So then you poop into a toilet, usually, and then it, it travels to where? The pipes. Think about where you are, wherever you are sitting right now, um, however close you are to the bathroom. Where are the pipes that go down from your toilet to what? Is it to a septic tank? Is it to the sewer system of your town? Does it go down two floors and then out? Um, it can be a pretty complex system that's hidden inside of the buildings where we spend so much time. But it could also look like this. This is a building at Oberlin College. Um, and you can see that it's covered in solar panels and then it also has that large section of glass. I'm gonna take you inside that building, the, the glass part right now. This is the septic field for this building at Oberlin. So all of the water and everything that comes with it from the toilets and the sinks all end up in this room. 
So that's why it needs to be made of glass is because of all of these living things in here that need the sunshine. So what happens is the water from that and the poop and everything else that gets washed down the drains um, gets brought to this room into these big containers where those nutrients are being processed. They're being processed by fish, by bacteria, by snails, by all sorts of living organisms that you can't see inside of the containers. In addition to the plants that are obviously flourishing with the use of these nutrients. So the plants, the bacteria, the fish, the snails all work together to get the water clean. And then that water is recycled back to the toilets of the building to be used again as flush water. It's a cycle. And this building has the whole cycle right included. It doesn't have to be transported away. And there's this cool scenery of these beautiful flowers and plants. So it is possible to cycle those nutrients in other ways. I was at the park with my son, Henry, and we were playing with some friends and I was talking with the other mom and I realized I, I didn't see where Henry went. This is when he was about three years old. I didn't see where Henry went, I was chatting. And, and so it's a pretty big park, you may know it. It's not too far from campus. It's got giant oak trees, it's really beautiful. Holmes Foster Park. And so I, I find Henry and he has just pooped under a tree. So what do I do? Is this mom moment of like, oh my God, my kid just pooped right here. Like, do I have to get a bag and pick this up? I don't have that with me. I don't know what to do. Um, and as soon as he finished pooping and we were just trying to get his pants back up and get organized, um, the flies had already found Henry's poop. And he said, oh my gosh, mom, look, the flies are using it already. It's just another way of nutrient cycling. And so in some places in the world, it's the flies, it's the animals, it's the other things that are decomposing that poop and helping the cycle. It doesn't have to be as separate as we make it. So take two minutes in your Zoom chat now around this topic, maybe around the topics of saliva um, and then also about poop. Could you poop outside if you needed to?
So we're going to loop back around now for a little bit. Um, the, the role of blood um, and the connection to both the water and the nutrient cycle. Somebody just pointed out in the chat, I like this, that um, saliva is what they take for DNA tests. We, our DNA is in all of those cells. Um, and so that's how, if you do an ancestry test, um, it's connecting, that saliva is connecting ancestry and genetics as well. I think that's, that's a pretty cool thought. Um, so thinking about how the blood, our blood connects the water cycle and the nutrient cycle. So blood is made in the marrow of our bones. It's always dying and it's always renewing. Bone marrow produces two million red blood cells every second, every second. The blood's 30,000, or excuse me, 30 trillion red cells do a full circle of the body traveling about 12,000 miles every day, every day. Special cells help absorb nutrients cross the intestinal lining uh, into your bloodstream. So those nutrients that were in, uh, broken down by the, the body, uh, mostly in the small intestine, and then it gets passed through to your bloodstream. And then it carries those simple sugars and amino acids, um, glycerol and vitamins and salts, hormones, all those things get moved around by your blood. Um, it's carrying all that stuff as well as heat and oxygen to all of our cells, as well as carrying away the waste products that we don't need. Blood clots when necessary. It fights infection and repels foreign invaders. Our blood is so powerful. There is so much information to be gained and explained about blood. And yet, in some cultures, blood is so sacred. Um, and in some cultures, blood is so separate. Um, it's just, I mean, obviously it's, it goes without saying, it's so vital to all of our being. Um, we're going to focus one particular distinct um, cycle of the blood. It's one half of our population, about 2 billion women at any one time are experiencing the menstrual cycle, a distinct a distinct cycle, a monthly cycle. And so as you know, this topic is very taboo in our culture and many, many women feel ashamed as they experience it. It was in 2011 that the brand Always ran this ad showing a menstrual pad with the small red dot in the middle. It's a simple, symbol of blood, that small red dot. And articles were written with text such as, pad ad takes the bold step of showing that periods are actually red. As I was growing up, if I saw commercials for feminine products, pads on TV, it was somebody pouring like blue water onto these to show how much they could absorb. Periods aren't blue. And it's not water, it's not at all like that. And so showing that the periods are actually red and that that's the, that's the point that it's this cycle of blood. It was a breakthrough in feminine hygiene product advertising and a bold step away from the blue liquid nonsense. The other, there was another breakthrough prior to this in the year 2000. Um, and here it is, um, that red dot. So as taboo as this might be in our culture, it's even more so 
in other cultures, some other cultures. For instance, in Jammu, which is a village in Western Nepal, menstruation is not just taboo, it's dirty. Um, the quote from people who live in this, this region of the world say, a menstruating woman is a powerful polluting thing. When women and girls have their periods, they must leave their homes and go out to their yards and stay in this, this hut, this hovel. It's called a chapodi. It's a shed. There's no heat. There's no electricity. There's no water. There's nothing. They get served a bowl of rice each day. They are not allowed to participate in any of the normal community events or things. They can't go to the market. They cannot accidentally brush up against someone. They are thought to be bringing bad luck. These sheds are often infested with other animals and with insects simply because there's not really shelter here. Although Nepal's Supreme Court banned Chapoti in 2005, the practice still continues, underscoring how normalized this custom is throughout the region. Although this is now against the law, there is no prosecution that for families that continue to use this practice um, and they don't even urge them to stop. There are some organizations or few um, that are demanding that the laws be banned um, or that it be, that this practice be banned. But to this day, it continues. And so what is this about? What is this that, that 2 billion women are experiencing this each month? Um, why, why do women experience this? Women have been menstruating since the beginning of women. It's an absolute function of life. We are in the minority of species to bleed every month. The only other animals known to menstruate are apes, old world monkeys, the elephant shrew, and four species of bats. There are some theories about why humans go through this monthly process. The most compelling of the arguments is that the lining of the uterus, um, where this little baby is tucked so comfortably, is that lining is called the endometrium. And our, in humans, the endometrium is so thick and nesty because our babies are so invasive to the mother's bodies. The fetus has a direct line to the mother's main blood supply which means that the baby can have a direct line. Um, the baby can manufacture hormones and then use them to manipulate the mother's blood sugar, dilate her arteries and inflate her blood pressure to provide itself with more nutrients. The baby is controlling the workings of the mother's body. The process of pregnancy is really taxing but so is the process that a woman's body goes through monthly to prepare for the possibility of carrying that baby. The endometrium swells with blood, which is what is expelled during a woman's period if there's no fetus that has attached. With this expelling of blood, there might be pain and bloating, hormonal swings and lack of energy. So it affects women pretty dramatically. Um, and yet we don't talk about it. This is the American story. Um, why don't we talk about this stuff? And what if we did? This is not just something, I'm not just talking to the women in this class, I'm talking to the men as well. We are all involved in this community of our species and to know what's going on and why it's going on 
can be beneficial to everyone. This is a product made by um, someone nearby, um, near to State College, and they're reusable menstrual pads. And why would anybody ever want to do this? They require a bit more energy, but they're organic. They're free of plastics, synthetic fibers, artificial fragrances, adhesives, and chemical gels that are present in disposable pads and tampons. The average American menstruator uses 14,000 disposables in their lifetime. 20 billion pads and tampons end up in landfills each year in the United States. The average American menstruator spends about $3,000 on disposables in their lifetime. And this product is beautiful. It's handmade. And so it brings beauty to the experience. And this is only the beginning of what we could do to shift our thinking. Um, because from one extreme to the other, this is the D Dagara tribe of West Africa. And they celebrate this time of menstruation. It is sacred. The flow of menstrual blood carries power. The mooning woman has special energy and a great ability to heal and see deeply into things. They say mooning because it's a 28 day cycle, just like the cycle of the moon. In the woman who wrote this, in my village, people seek help from such a woman and they treat her with great respect. The sacredness, the flip side. So all of these cycles are about our connection to earth air and water and nutrients. How could that sort of thinking change you? And how would that sort of thinking change our culture? Take two minutes in your group at this point and just talk about this possibility. So all of this is for your consideration. It is metacognition, which means thinking about your thinking. You'll see this image in the weeks to come. Understanding why I believe what I do is important. So remember this week that you have choice to think about your thinking. Um, you have your choice to make up your own question for Pack Back this week. I encourage you to be curious in deep ways, maybe even, or especially even curious about yourself. Maybe that extra credit nature, extra credit mystery is about you. I hope that you have a beautiful day and an excellent week and I'll see you on Monday.